Hi everybody, welcome back to uh, Pause and Reflect. I'm Corey Cohen from Path of Friendship. And this here is Bodhi, and there is Bhakti back here. And um, we're gonna take a moment to start with just connecting with our dogs uh, in a mindful way. And just, just to review, I mean, mindfulness is no great uh, sort of this ethereal, out-of-body experience. It's pretty much um, just paying attention to the present without being lost in our thoughts and, and, and having these narratives in our head that's gone on going and on going and on going. Pretty much the way our dogs experience the world most of the time. So let's just take a moment to tune into their channel, right? We're going to tune into their way of thinking and just pet them and feel their fur beneath your hand. Take a breath in, feel how your breath feels in your body. It's really a, a very, uh, it's almost a somatic experience. It's, it's, it's being in touch with everything that's going on in your body, even your thoughts, even thinking about your, your thoughts or, or uh, being aware that you're thinking of these things. Um, doesn't mean you have to push them away. There's really no force in mindfulness. We don't force our thoughts away or try to block them or try to force other thoughts of, of coming in. It's, it's pretty much just not interfering and allowing. Um, sort of what the Taoists call uh, Wu Wei, which is non-doing. It really means non-interference or, or non-striving or non-driving or, or trying to get, which is pretty much the way our, our dogs are. And this is very important to share these moments with our dogs, to be on the same page as them, to be on the, that same mindful channel, if you will, that present moment channel, with their, if you will, really make our emotional connection to them solid. And the relationship that we want to have with our dogs is, is that of a, of a sanctuary friendship. And I love that, the, the idea of sanctuary friendship, because in our friendship together, we should both all of us feel safe, secure, no cares, no worries. And that's really what we're going for. And that can only happen when we're linked together and connected on the same plane. It can't happen if there's a hierarchy. It can't happen if there's a um, lot of conflict. It can only happen when we're together and you, taking these sort of moments of attunement, these mindful moments of attunement to connect with our dogs really solidifies and creates that sanctuary friendship for both of us. And so many issues, so many problems that we experience with our dogs have to do with the lack of this secure sanctuary attachment. Things like separation anxiety or reactivity to other dogs or many forms of aggression or fear. It, 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 it's a way of, of sort of withdrawing our dogs, withdrawing to themselves, or we withdraw into ourselves. And it's that sort of separation thing that happens there. And uh, that's really where the fear comes in. Um, hi Cecil, there's Cecil there. Um, so when we're together, we sort of broaden that or, or relax those walls and those defenses that we put up because we feel safe with each other. And that's the basis for having that relationship. And all too often we, we have problems and we try to manipulate or coerce our dogs into changing what they do, just their behavior, without getting into the core of that connective response. That sort of social engagement is so critical in behavioral and emotional health. And unfortunately, we, we lose a lot of that when we deal with issues and problems with our dogs by training as if, we, as, as if they were a circus act or as if they were an employee or as if they were a subservient pack member. We engage in these types of top-down, me on top, you on the bottom, trying to manipulate and, and, and alter their behaviors to solve the problems. It, on the surface, it can work. On the surface, it, it can stop the behavior, but it doesn't stop the stuff that's going on. It really only masks the symptoms. You know, reactivity to other dogs, that's not a problem. That's a symptom of, of a, of a dis-ease. 
You know, if you think of the word disease, it's really dis-ease. So dogs are not at ease. Or um, separation anxiety, being nervous when they're alone. That's not a problem. That is a symptom of some underlying dis-ease. And connecting and getting a close attachment with them and being on the same level and mindful sharing, this attuned mindful sharing is one way of really doing that. Um, so let's take a moment again just to pause and connect with our dogs this way. And with mindfulness, we always use, begin with sort of anchor points, kind of like a spotlight. So uh, quite often it, it's the breath. We breathe in, we breathe out. We just kind of notice our breath as the anchor and then or as a spotlight and then expand that spotlight out to a floodlight to include other things. We can do that with our dogs, but one way is touching them and petting them and feeling their bodies and their fur beneath our hands and focusing on that sensation, that's an anchor point. But it's a shared anchor point because not only is it an anchor point that we can focus on, it's an anchor point that our dogs focus on the feeling of our hand going over them. So let's take up just a moment to pet them, connect. You don't think of things or don't I mean, if, you, if thoughts will come in, you, you don't want to try to stop them, but just kind of watch them go by as uh, sort of the, the traditional way of looking at it is clouds going overhead, which is the more popular way of looking at it, or I like to think of it as just watching a stream and maybe a leaf coming down the stream. You don't want to grab the leaf. You don't want to hold on to it. Let it go. You notice it, it comes, and then it goes. So when thoughts come in, let them come in and then let them go. And then reconnect and refocus Hey, Rocco. This is Rocco. And by the way, we're focusing on dogs in this, in this program, but this really works really well for our cats, too. Um, move my phone here so he doesn't step on it. Uh, it but or, or any animals. Or, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's, it's a way of focusing and, and connecting with them. So we're gonna, we pause for a moment with that. Now, I want to talk today about what happens with conflicts. You know, last time we spoke about having this unconditional love and unconditional acceptance with, with our dogs or our cats. Rocco, I'm not leaving you out. Or our cats. And it's, it's not our, our affection and our actions of love is an outflowing. It's based not on what they do for us. It's not saying, you know, Rocco will only love you if you don't, you know, scratch the furniture. Or, or, or Bodhi, I'll only love you if you... Uh, obey me when I tell you to sit or things that that it takes away there's no sanctuary in that there's no friendship in that that's a business transaction it's conditional and we do that too often with our dogs so this unconditional love what we spoke about last time is it makes us vulnerable and it, and it exposes us because we're giving out and we're giving out what um, what we want to do is sometimes conflicts will arise and sometimes what we allow ourselves to do or we're loving our dogs and accepting for who they are conflicts with other things that will make us happy. And it's not that we want to just sort of lay down and be a doormat and say, well, you guys do whatever you want. I'll love you no matter what. And how I feel is not important. That's not good either. It has to be a balance. It has to be an equal relationship. And so conflicts will arise at times. There is a way to turn that friction. You know, sometimes your dog will do something and you do something, and there's a lot of friction there. But there's a way to turn that friction into traction, right? You can't have traction to move forward. Good traction on good tires moves you forward. Good traction on shoes gets you to move forward. But you can't have that traction without some friction. So we can sort of look at it a different way and look at that friction as a way of traction moving forward. And it really begins with compassionate communication, not training. Compassionate communication. Here's what I mean by, by compassionate communication. How am I supposed to, how is Bodhi, let's say, let's say Bodhi, let's say what does Bodhi do? I don't really do much that, uh, but, oh, okay, here's one thing. When he wants to go out, sometimes he gets too excited, he'll scratch He'll, he'll start pawing at the door. We have a screen door, and I'm afraid he'll tear it. 
So it's important to me that he doesn't tear the screen door because I don't feel like repairing it or, or paying for a new one. Um, it's also, I, I, so that's a conflict of interests. He wants to get out fast. I don't want him to scratch the screen door. Now I could train him to do other things there, but better yet, I want to be able to communicate to Bodhi and say, Bodhi, this really bothers me. We're going to go out together. We're going to have a good time together. But can we try to do this a different way so we're both happy? So how is Bodhi supposed to know that I don't like that unless I tell him? So I can tell him a few ways. I could be really firm and scold him and yell, no. Well, what would that do? First of all, how would he know what I'm scolding him for? Am I scolding him for the desire to go out? Maybe. Am I just scolding him for the fact that uh, he's standing to the left of me? I mean, there, there are just too many variables for, for that. So how would he know that I'm scolding him for scratching at the door? Secondly, the whole idea of scolding implies that my way is the only way, that I'm the boss and he must listen and he's not obeying and therefore he needs a good scolding. Well, I don't feel that way. I feel that we, we live in this house together. It's as much his as it is mine, even though I pay the, pay the bills, but it's, it's, it's our home together. And so what I want to do is be able to communicate to Bodhi what I don't want very clearly and that's part of compassion is being very focused and being very clear about the message. So I want to make sure that I'm not sending the wrong message. I mean I could also tell him go the opposite and make him do something like sit and give him a treat. But that takes his mind away from the actual issue. Now all of a sudden he's focused on the treat. He's not focused on going out. So I really sort of avoided the subject by doing that. You know those kind of distraction techniques may work temporarily, but they don't really get to the root of the problem. I mean, that's like saying, doctor, it hurts when I do this, and the doctor says, well, don't do this. Yeah, it works, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Again, it's dealing with symptoms, it's not dealing with the actual root cause of it. So I want to make sure I'm very clear in my communication, and depending on the dog, there are so many different ways to do this. But I also want to make sure that my message to him is not just what he doesn't do, but how I feel about what he's doing. Because as friends, we should learn to adjust each other's and how we feel with each other. And how is Bodhi supposed to know how I feel unless I tell him? So I could sit, sit him down on a chair, get a cup of tea, and say, listen, Bodhi, here's the deal. I'm not happy when you do this. You're going to rip the screen and all these kind of things. That's using our our human-to-human -human symbolic communication through words. Dogs have the ability to communicate symbolically, but nothing close to the way humans are. So I really can't explain it to him and, and tell him about that. I, I have to show him. So when I show him, what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm showing him in a way that he understands that it's my feelings and it's very contained, but not so much that it pushes him too high. Here's a way of looking at it. If we think of two lines, an upper line and a lower line, and in between those two lines is where effective and compassionate communication happen. If it's above the line, so let's say I yell no and he gets nervous. Well, if I yelled no and that communication went above the line here, meaning he understood no, but, but it, he gets into a little nervousness and becomes a little agitated that I have communicated to him. I've lost the message. It's too much. I've made him agitated. On the other hand, if I do pretty much nothing, then it's below that line and he still hasn't got the message. It's kind of like the Goldilocks effect, right? One bed's too soft, one bed's too hard, one bed is just right. Or, if you're musically inclined, as I used to play guitar, it's like tuning a guitar. Too loose, a string on the guitar too loose, no sound. String on the guitar too tight, it's not in tune, it could even break. There's only one right way of going. And so I have to communicate with Bodhi and constantly get feedback from him by looking at him and getting the feeling from him is, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you feel how I feel? And that's the critical area. Now, in a short video, I can't tell you 
how to do that with your dog. But what I can tell you and what you can do is you can use sort of your gut feeling. And I know people are like, well, what do you mean? I'm not a professional. I, I don't work with dogs. The truth of the matter is it's innate in all of us. This type of communication with non-human animals, even humans, is part of who we are. We're hardwired for these connections. And we're hardwired for this sort of sensitivity, this empathy to come back and forth. We can expand it a lot, but we have what's known as mirror neurons, and, and so does Rocco, and so does Bodhi, and everybody, most higher mammals have, in fact, I think even, I don't want to misquote here, but I think other animals besides mammals have mirror neurons, which are right here, the, my brain, right, right back in there. And they're what uh, deal with emotional contagion. We can kind of look at someone else and almost put ourselves in their shoes or copy what they're doing. So the ability is in us. And if you've ever watched children with dogs, and I'm not talking about um, older children who already have started to feel that separation from other things. I'm talking about very young children, toddlers. They have this unique ability to just communicate with pretty much everything. I mean, they can, rabbits and fish even, and, and dogs and cats, they, they have a connection there because they're not, they haven't learned yet that they are this separate higher creature that they've been taught, even though we're not, but we kind of push our children into that mindset but they haven't learned that yet. And they have this ability to communicate. I, the, the, the best communicators, the best, most empathic people I've ever known have all been three, four years old, five years old. And far better than any professional I've ever met in that because they are working naturally. So my point is that every dog is going to be different in how we communicate. And every dog is going to be different on that safety zone, that effectiveness zone, that one that's just right, that perfect tuning, or possibly a perfect attunement to each other, which is really more accurate. But what I can suggest is, you know your dog. You know their expressions. You know how they feel. You get that feeling that, man, maybe I went too far, or maybe they're not getting this enough. And you can communicate with them without having to pick up a book and say, uh, chapter three, Communicate to a dog this way. You know what? Living, breathing, thinking, feeling creatures and beings like ourselves and our dogs do not fit into these algorithmic books. They don't. Sometimes they do, but for every rule, there is an equal number of exceptions. And so the best teacher for you is not me, is not some professional who hangs a shingle out who's going to train your dog in, you know, 10 minutes or whatever, is you having that connected feeling and communicating compassionately with your dog on how you feel. It's okay to tell our dogs how we feel. I would tell my friends how I feel. If my friend had a habit of poking me in the head every time we sat down, I wouldn't have any problem saying, that really bothers me, please stop. And if they're my friend and they care about how I feel, which we do with our dogs, that's what friends are, then they would say, oh, okay, Corey, I didn't realize that really bothered you. I'm going to stop it. So, compassionate communication, using our guts, learning to connect with our dogs is vital. And it all starts with these moments of mindful connection, mindful attunement, where we're not off someplace else and our dogs are here. We're, we're really together. And that's what really solidifies us and gets that, those brainwaves of each other to sort of vibrate at the same way, to really, really, really connect. So we're, we're not just in harmony with each other, but as uh, Emerson once said, friends are not just in harmony, but in melody. And that's really where we want to get to on that same, same level. So that's what compassionate communication is. And that friction that we have when we learn to find that out and, and get those points of a connection, isn't it that in itself is another mindful connection that gives us the traction to move forward and to move beyond and to really advance our friendships and deepen our emotional connection with each other. And it's important to do that. 
We have to set boundaries for ourselves and we have to set boundaries for our dogs. As much as I love my dogs, there are things that they cannot do. They cannot run into the street chasing a squirrel. That's a boundary. I must set that because that is import, obviously important for them. But they, they set boundaries for me as well. And it's important that we are sensitive to what their boundaries are. Like if I know Bodhi doesn't like his feet being touched too much. So why do it? Why cross that boundary and says, I have a right to do it if I know he doesn't like it? Unless there's a super valid reason for, for doing that, to, to help him to, to maybe keep his nails short or to uh, do wipe ice balls out of it or something like that. But there are boundaries that we have and we must maintain our, these boundaries and that helps us feel secure with each other. To know that these boundaries are respected and know these boundaries are understood and we love them and love each other because we have the respect and mutual um, consideration for each other that way. So, that's what turning friction into traction is. That's what resolving conflicts. It's really conflict resolution. It's not, I'm going to fix you or you're going to fix me. It's like, hey, we've got this problem together. How do we solve it? We've got this problem. You want to go out and I want to go out, but I also don't want to spend money on a new screen door. So how are we going to fix this problem? And we work it out. By the way, what I do with Bodhi is when, when he gets that energy, I sit down with him and I just pet him and I just tell him, let's calm down a little bit. And so that works really well. I'm telling him I don't like the door. And if he does it, I'll say, come on, stop, stop that. I'll tell him to stop it, but not in a way that's going to frighten him nor am I going to distract him from it. I'm going to tell him stop it, and then I'm going to pet him and show, let's do the same thing, but let's do it calmly so it becomes, I hate to be cliche, but it becomes a win-win scenario. He gets what he wants, I get what, what I want, and we get a moment of connection so that win-win puts us in a position of a synergistic solution, which is even greater than the two parts, right? You know, synergy is, normal things is one plus one equal two, Synergy is one plus one equal three. It's a, it's a greater thing. We can't always get to that, but in this case we did. So when we're dealing with conflicts with our dogs, think of them as conflicts that we must resolve together and find solutions that bring us even closer together and make our sanctuary friendship even more secure, right? Without having to resort to bribery or distraction or punishment or yelling or intimidation or any of those manipulation or any of those kind of things, we don't need to resort to that when we have this kind of connectedness with our dogs. So that's something that we can reflect on. So today, let's take away from that, let's reflect on how can we communicate better with our dogs in a way that they understand and we get the results that we want and we both respect each other and whenever there's conflicts, it's an opportunity to grow further and that's something that we, we can respect on we can respect each other for. And that's a great thing to reflect on. So, with that said, I look forward to uh, the next one. And um, Rocco here says, Rocco just turned 17, by the way. Rocco says, have a great day. Enjoy. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.